Our first speaker on that, this panel is Michael Scholl. He's general manager of the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. As general manager, Michael oversees more than 16,000 acres of parkland, 6,000 full and part-time employees, and manages a $194 million operating budget. He was appointed in December 2013 and began his career with City of Los Angeles in 1990 with the City Department's um, Department of Public Works Bureau of Engineering. Uh, he's been with, he was with the in Bureau of Engineering for 14 years. He served as project manager on a variety of large city projects before becoming involved in many of the uh, implementation of many of the department and park, re park and recreation projects where his knowledge and interest has grown and which he'll share a lot with you about today. Uh, let me first by thanking the, the Land Trust and Elena particularly who we are uh, partners in crime on a number of uh, projects here in LA. And um, I'm just pleased to be here, pleased to talk about this. I almost feel like although many of the slides that I have to show you are almost moot and now it's already been covered. <laughs> so it's where uh, Dr. Boone probably covered most of the stuff that I was going to talk about. But I'll try to spend more time on uh, you know, implementation factors um, than the planning process, um, although the planning process is extremely important. And I, I, there's a few points that I'll emphasize it really resonated with me in the, in the speakers uh, earlier today. So the objective of what we coined is the, the 50 Parks Initiative. About seven years ago, or eight years ago, when the economic crisis really started to happen, prior to that, it was, we found it extremely challenging to find land, especially, I mean, anywhere in the city. It didn't matter where it was. It was just very, very difficult. A lot of land was locked up and just being held. It was, um, it was very expensive, um, and it, you know, offered, if we didn't have enough challenges already in LA, that was, you know, a, a major one. And um, we didn't really have a lot of opportunities afforded to us back then um, until the economic crisis happened. And then, you know, and it's funny, but that's actually when um, we really started to say, this is, this is the time. And it's, it's the time to, to really start to begin to green the city um, because land became available and it became more, less expensive. Um, it became less desirable to even own land by some because they just needed out. Um, but it was also flying in the face of a time where park, you know, departments across the nation were cutting back. We took a risk, and we continue to take a risk, on moving in the other direction. Um, if you look at our, uh, our budgets and our, um, our staffing levels, you know, they've declined consistently for seven, eight years, just like everybody else in the nation, we're no different. Um, but if you look at the number of parks, it's drastically gone the other direction, um, which again flies in the face of uh, you know, what was really happening. It continues to happen as I speak to others across the nation about things that they're doing in the parks department. So um, all that is great, and the 50 parks is great, but um, it's not nearly enough. Um, it's, not, it, it's a great start. So we came up, it says, why 50? Well, 50 was, uh, we needed to make it impactful. We wanted it to sound impactful. Um, it could be 200. I mean, it could be 300. It probably needs to be 300. Uh, we just used 50 because we wanted it. We needed some. We needed to get some energy around something, um, and um, so we chose 50. So there really is no magic. People ask me that all the time, but it was just the, the idea of coming up with an impactful number. Um, so you know, the equity. I mean, it really. It's really about all the equity issues that you've already heard about. Is, is that's really where we wanted to focus. It's it's a large system. Um, it's, um, it sounds like a lot, our operating budget sounds like a lot, but our operating budget is you know, less than half of many other large cities in the nation. I mean, it's, um, we do a lot with little in LA, I believe. And um, you know, one of the things that we're probably most proud of, which um, adds acreage in my mind, is the programming that we do in our park system, much more than many other large cities in the nation. We spend a lot of time and money on programming, which to us adds value in acreage. Um, so it's, you know, this presentation today is about adding parks, but there's many other issues that we have to address to really address this equity issue, and one is making sure that we have proper programming going on at all of our parks. You can start by building a park and then everything else comes with it. You know, it's, um, I've noticed in some of these parks that we built, um, pocket parks, you know, in these neighborhoods, um, they quickly turned, um, in less than a year, you can drive down the same street, and it, the street looks different. It looks different, and I, I, it's because of that park, all of a sudden, Houses have been painted and things have happened in that neighborhood and all of a sudden it just takes on a different flavor and they're more proud of what's going on in their community because we've invested in their community. 
And I, you know, I've seen that on the economic end of all these parks um, many times over, especially in the South Los Angeles area. Social benefits, as Dr. Boone was saying as well, um, I often, I mean, I have two young children and, you know, their experiences start, you know, with their involvement into nature and all that start with the playground generally. I mean, that's generally where everybody, I, I think playgrounds play an important role in all these park systems at a very, very early age. Um, it begins to introduce our kids for the first time to, to what's possible. It challenges them and it gets them thinking about and ma their imagination going. It's all these things that there's many kids in these areas that we talk about that are on, you know, not equitable, that, that are lost, that they don't have. So it's, it is about nature and it's about all that. But it's, sometimes it's just simply about building a playground. I mean, it, it's, you know, and I think one of the speakers today I thought said it best. These neighborhoods don't have the, the basics. I mean, we can talk about all these grandiose visions, but there are some communities that just don't have the basic services. If we provide them with the basic service, the other things will come. Nature will come. The stormwater quality benefits will come. All of those things will come, but it doesn't start without the park and the very basics. So the challenges that we faced, um, obviously, are the enormity of the scale here in Los Angeles. I mean, it's um, it, geographically, we're spread. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I lose a lot of sleep over it. I mean, it's just trying to figure it out and where to focus your resources and and um, pinning down into those areas uh, of, of, of need and, and making sure that resources are diverted there. The, the enormity of the scale of the challenge that we have is huge. And um, you know, so what the 50 Parks Initiative is about, it's about starting to address that, at least on the acreage side of things and providing uh, open space. Obviously, the availability of land, um, property values, of course, with the economic downturn, that helped us a great deal. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit later about um, you know, how we were able to accomplish some of those things. Obviously, our budget cuts, you know, it's, um, it's uh, and then again, it's not just LA, it's, it's every city in the nation is facing the same, same challenges. Um, and that goes in with available resources, you know, identifying capital funding and ongoing maintenance is the one that everybody likes to talk about, is, uh, is maintenance. And it continues to be a challenge uh, for us here in LA. Um, we first uh, developed priority areas for what we call the 2009 um, needs assessment. It was a citywide needs assessment that we did, um, basically going around and um, there's a number of stakeholder meetings, community meetings that took place and just asking the public and different stakeholders about what they thought of the park system, what they thought we needed to do, what we needed to focus, focus on, so on and so forth. And it's really from that that we developed the, the initial footprint for, for the 50 Parks Initiative. We inventoried all the available, available properties. So if you look at the maps, as one was shown for Baltimore, of all the surplus city land, it's just not city surplus land. It's land that's owned by the Department of Water and Power, land that was owned by the Housing Department, land that was owned by Caltrans, you know, looking at all those different pieces um, to figure out uh, what we could acquire, and in some cases it was free, um, and we started with that. And then we started looking at all of those properties and identifying which one of those are really in these areas of priority, areas like Wilmington, areas like South Los Angeles, areas like Pacoima, all of those areas that we thought um, that was the low-hanging fruit is to find all those properties in those areas that we could get for nothing. Um, but we couldn't do it. We, we decided early on that the, the, you know, it's obviously too huge of a task um, for us to do. We, we began a, um, you know, looking at our partners Land Trust is, is, is a major partner with the Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative, the Trust for Public Land, the MRCA, the Parks Foundation, and all of our uh, land uh, partners like Water and Power and Caltrans and the Housing Department, all of, those, all of those were collectively assembled and we began to look at it as one plan together. So it really wasn't you know, a 50 Parks Initiative by the Recreation and Parks Department, it was a 50 Parks Initiative by a coalition that we created with our, with our partners. And the planning that went into that and this is interesting, is that you know, we, we, we did receive, um, we went to our housing department, for example, and we asked them, um, because we knew that under the Obama administ administration, they'd received a lot of money to acquire uh, properties that have gone, uh, that basically had gone defunct, belly up, bankrupt, have, what have you, and they were all residential properties. And in that legislation, we found that they actually allowed, it, allowed for those properties to be turned to parks, but we didn't, nobody told us about it. We, I forget exactly how we came about it, but we happened to be um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, one year, and we went and talked to the HUD, uh, the HUD about it, because there were some uh, folks working at HUD that came from the mayor's office so that helped us get an invitation there. And, 
And we found out that we could actually approach housing and, and get some of these properties from, from our local housing department, and it was all perfectly legal, and it wasn't co wouldn't cost us anything. So when we approached them, they said, this is a great idea. We'll develop, you know, we have like 300 properties here in Los Angeles, the properties, the residential properties that we bought up. We're going to, um, how about we work together in those areas that I just mentioned to you uh, about uh, properties that are the worst of the worst, like the properties that are just like, you know, the absolute worst you have. So they gave us like 20, it was right about 20 properties to look at. They said, well, you only have like, you know, a year and a half to, to get these done. This is, you know, we got to get this moving. So they were very skeptical about giving us these properties. So the very first thing I, that we decided to do, and this goes into the community piece that, that we've heard uh, practically every speaker talk about, and we took that piece very, very seriously. They had, the communities have to have ownership in these parks. They abs it's an absolute must. So when we went to some of those communities, um, and most of those properties were in South Los Angeles, all but maybe one or two were not. And only 10 of those properties got parks. The other 10, the community was completely opposed to. I mean, in some cases, when we showed up on Saturday mornings, because that's when we did our planning, we decided not to do evening events. And that's one thing I would impress upon you is this evening. I'm not one for, especially in these lower income areas, of doing community meetings in the evening. Most times, these, you know, they're single parents. They're working multiple jobs. They, they don't have time to come to your meeting at night. And um, so what we decided to do was show up in these neighborhoods. And I, I wanted particularly, I wanted to, the department wanted to know what that local community thought about that park, about the possibility of a park being there. All of a sudden, you know, if you take down a house between you and your neighbor's house and you say you're going to put a park there, people, they're, you know, they want to hear what you have in mind. I mean, that's a, it's a pretty significant change. And it, it's these little pocket parks. And in some cases, when we'd show up on a Saturday morning to do our, our presentation, we would flyer the neighborhood in advance to try to get them. And they'd be coming out to get their groceries or do whatever on their Saturday morning. We got very good participation, number one, by doing it that way. But we also, also got a lot of folks showing up saying, no way. We don't trust you. There's no way we're going to support this. And with good reason. I mean, these neighborhoods have had so little investment in them that it is important that you earn their trust. And we tried and tried and tried <laughs> on a number of those, but we just decided at the end of the day, if that community didn't completely want it and didn't want to completely own it, we weren't going to build it. Because we can't afford, I can't, just can't afford to do that. The community has to have ownership of it. So we built the 10 parks, and unfortunately those properties aren't, aren't available to us now, but I would love to go back now and show those communities of the 10 that we did build you know, and try like a second round, but because of the, the money that housing had, they had to move on with their projects. So they ended up, you know, this community still got a, a, a new home or refurbished home out of it, but they could have had a park. Um, so that was an interesting thing. And I, and I go, you know, it, it just resonates with me when you talk about the community because it's, um, it is vitally important that they have ownership of their parks. Um, we obviously designed these parks in, a, in a what we, you know, very, very, in the smartest way we could, the most sustainable way that we could to keep maintenance to the absolute minimum. And things like, just simple things like on playgrounds, using, we didn't use a lot of sand on any of those playgrounds. We used rubber resilient surfacing um, just because the maintenance cost in that is, is a lot less. I, it's, you know, I know much kids love sand, um, but it, it's, it is a challenge to keep clean. And so there are some parks that we, we left some measurement of sand, but we put mostly rubber resilient surfacing. It's a lot more expensive to do it that way, but um, that was one of the things that we did. Everything, all the lighting is LED. We put solar power trash cans in the, in the parks and, um, you know, to, to basically keep all the costs down. We tried to standardize our infrastructure without taking away from the different unique design components of it. And, um, did a lot of work on the back end of pre-qualifying contractors and things to make it go, uh, to make the projects go faster. Um, job tolerant landscaping, smart irrigation designs. Here's some of the things I talked about from the maintenance side of things um, that we continue to use all throughout the park system now. So here's the status of where we're at. Um, you can see the the flashing stars there. They're the um, where the the parks have been focused, and I'm pretty certain that those match the areas that we were looking at earlier. We look at inequities. Um, we really have tried to focus in those areas. So we're beyond 50 now. We've got 61 sites identified, um, and we've received over $129 million in funding. Um, a lot of that funding came from uh, Proposition 84 for new parks. Just from that money alone, we've already opened 18 new parks with Proposition 84 money. 
for those of those people from the state who I don't agree with, says we're not spending our money, that's a bunch of nonsense. Um, more than a dozen, we've done this with more than a dozen partners, as I, I mentioned before, because we, we knew we couldn't do it alone. A little bit more status, uh, we started in about fall of 2010. Uh, right now, we've currently got 53 sites under our control. Um, since 2010, we've opened 24 new parks, so we're nearly halfway there. Um, I don't know of any agency in the, in the nation that's opened as many parks as we've had in such a short amount of time. Um, we have nine parks that are currently in construction, some with the land trust currently. I believe three in Lena with, that are in two or three. Anyway, <laughs> two um, that are in construction with the, with the land trust. Um, I did a, quick, we did a quick little snapshot of um, the seven parks that we opened just last year. Um, that's 80,000 people live within a half a mile of that park. Um, it's interesting to go back and, you know, it's, uh, to look at those. A lot of those were opportunity sites from these housing, you know, rundown housing projects, um, so we didn't actually get to choose. Um, and then uh, worth noting, our partners are doing 23 of the 61 sites, so it's not all city of LA is, is the point. Just a couple before and after shots of, uh, this was a site um, uh, just, a, just not far from downtown. That's what it looks like today. I mean, you, you just can't get, I mean, that was like a hillside. It was con completely contaminated. It was an old oil site. Um, you know, you really have to re keep your vision. I think this will look familiar to, to uh, the land trust. This was a project that we did at 11th Avenue. This is what it looked like before. <laughs> we did this project with Kaboom, you know, and it's got a great playground picnic area and everything now. Um, and I'm gonna wrap up. This was a 49th Street uh, park. You know, that's what it looks like today after the house was removed and the, the property was uh, made into a park. Many of these parks, we, we're very proud of the number of fitness zones that we have citywide. We have 58 fitness zones across the city where our goal is to get to 100. Um, and they make great, these pocket parks make a great place to do that. And I know I have a few more minutes and I wanna just talk a little bit about a couple of other things that are not on the slide. What's missing from all this is, um, because I don't think we're, uh, we, need to, we need to kind of rebrand this initiative. Um, and one of the things that we don't have in here is joint use opportunities with LAUSD, as well as the LA River and everything that's going on along the LA River. And of course, we can't ever leave out the discussion about transportation. You know, and as you heard some of the speakers talk about today, we need to figure out ways, and I just recently spoke to the MRCA about this, and seeing if there isn't a way of um, getting some of these parks, you know, maybe a small pocket park that we just built in a neighborhood about maybe on a Saturday afternoon about getting some buses there to take some kids out to even Griffith Park. Griffith Park is great. It's 4,000 acres. It's a huge park, but it just doesn't serve, you know, um, the folks in, in South Los Angeles. They have really no way to get there, and it's transportation is a big issue here in Los Angeles. Collective impact. Um, we recently met with a lot of nonprofit partners. Um, I would encourage you to follow up with me if you want to be involved with this. We're trying to um, get everybody together under, you know, there's all these great things happening with the, the river re revitalization and people for parks want to do, you know, all these school uh, playground projects. We're trying to get this all under one, one agenda so that we can plan for one agenda, particularly because we need to have a plan for, this, for all of these things to be sustainable on the operations end. We need to spend a lot of time and, and planning for that. We're going in the wrong direction on resources. We need to figure out how to reverse that. And we need to figure out how, and, and I believe we cannot do it without a, a strong partnership. Lastly, we're working on a, um, a, a system that will help identify some of these inequities. Um, it's, we're calling it our GIS decision support system. We have GIS systems. This one's going to be unique because it will help us measure, and I'm out of time, it'll help us measure the uh, dis dis distances um, by walking taking into account the barriers or freeways and things like that. There are lots of programs out there that operate at 30,000 feet. Ours will operate at about 5,000 feet so that we can get more detailed. So if we have a choice in neighborhoods where to build parks, we can put, make sure the parks are in the most impacted areas and decide to build our parks in a smarter way. Um, so I'll end it with that since I'm out of time, but I can talk for a bunch more longer, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Elva uh, was appointed to the California State Park and Recreation Commission in 2011 by Governor Jerry Brown. She is currently the principal of Calibri Strategies, a private consulting firm serving nonprofit organizations, government agency, and foundations in the areas of public policy, urban parks, public health, land use, and the built environment. Calibri services focus on policy advocacy, strategic planning, civic engagement, and communications. 
Elva has a long history of involvement in community-driven policy initiatives in both the public health um, and environmental spheres. And my pages have gotten out of order here. I um, have had the pleasure of working with Elva on a number of issues um, related to parks and health equity. Uh, she is a, also a consultant to the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust and really has been instrumental in helping the board understand the importance of park equity and policy work in Los Angeles and I really appreciate her work to help um, support that aspect of the organization. Elva's talk will focus on the City of Los Angeles Quimby policy and the Land Trust campaign to make improvements as a mean to increase resources for parks and open space in park poor communities. Welcome Elva. In order to reverse park inequities, advocates must work on systemic or policy change in addition to creating more park space and getting people into those spaces. So in this presentation, I'm going to spend my time focusing on policy, and specifically Quimby policy. How many of you are familiar with Quimby policy? Great. Yay. <laughs> uh, that's good. So my goals today are to really explain uh, state and local Quimby policy for those who don't know about it, maybe for some of you who do know some but not enough. Uh, describe recent activity on this policy and review the land trust recommendations for improvements. And I also have uh, Don Spivak who uh, is a partner in crime and uh, really the expert who uh, was this, the force in uh, developing the policy brief, which I don't have in front of me, but there's a few copies up outside. I'm going to review those recommendations for improvements and then outline next steps. The Land Trust Board of Directors decided to get involved in policy about two years ago. And our initial grant from the California Endowment allowed us to take a deep dive into Quimby policy and do a thorough analysis of both the State Act and LA's local implementing ordinances. Under, underlying our analysis was the question, how could the local Quimby law be improved and increase resources for park and open space in LA's park poor neighborhoods. In addition to the analysis of the Quimby policy, we also took a look at LA's uh, policy advocacy infrastructure. You guys, and, and who's out there and what have they been working on um, over the last 10 to 15 years and which groups were seen to be um, uh, policy leaders. And we were very pleased to find that uh, advocates see the land trust as a credible, trusted organization capable of bringing folks together to do this kind of work. Out of this analysis, the Land Trust, Trust developed a comprehensive policy brief. There's a few copies out in front. Um, and we also, out of that, developed a, a fact sheet, which is in your handout, in your uh, packet. Um, both documents are, are available online on the, web, uh, the Land Trust website. And we also began developing a policy advocacy initiative and coalition to improve Quimby. Uh, improving LA's Quimby policy is an important but initial step in addressing the broader policy and budget changes required to reverse park inequities in Los Angeles. While making improvements to Quim Quimby will not eliminate park inequities overall, it provides an important opportunity to come together and work collectively to make policy change. Given the high level of support for changing Quimby both in and outside City Hall, Many people have referred to it as a low-hanging fruit opportunity. Uh, broader policy and uh, budget agenda to address inequities would include things like um, increased city allocations for park and recreation services, uh, mitigation fees that would create funds from all development, not just residential housing, uh, reliable, more reliable sources of state and federal funding for local parks and open space. For example, the Urban Parks and Recreation Recovery Program was established in 1978 to provide matching grants and technical assistance to economically distressed communities, but it hasn't been funded since 2002. So a little bit of background on, on the State Quimby Act. It was adopted in 1965 at the height of suburbanization and white flight. Uh, to create dedicated park and recreation facilities or fees from new residential development. And what this means is anytime there's a new subdivision to create uh, new homes or condos or convert condos, 
fees are, uh, the cities or counties can uh, levy fees on those developments. And those fees are u then used to offset the impact of those new residents on the park and, and recreation system. Um, in the state of California, the Quimby Act limited uh, this to park demand created by new subdivisions. And it's really important to understand that Quimby was not intended, was never intended to address in existing park deficiencies. Uh, Quimby, the state Quimby Act allows cities and counties to establish local policy to secure these fees. It requires a reasonable relationship between the fees or dedicated land related to that new development and the use of the resulting facilities by the residents of the new de development. In other words, there had to be a geographic relationship between the development that was generating the fees and the new park facility. It also required that the city or county develop a general or specific plan containing policies and standards for park and recreation facilities. Uh, it specified these fees could, cannot be used for operations and maintenance. Uh, when we did the analysis, we found there are um, some limitations with LA Quimby policy, as many of you know, that exists. Um, the service radii defined by the LA Public Recreation Plan is much more restrictive than required by the state. It, you could say that overall about this policy. It's much more restrictive than the state ever intended it to be. The credits for developer constructed facilities are very low and actually serve as a disincentive to uh, housing developers to um, build recreation facilities. There's deferrals for affordable housing units within, within mixed income developments. But these deferrals are applied to the whole development. Say you had 100 new units coming in. You had 20 of those units being affordable. The entire development gets deferred from Quimby, which results in the lost, um, lost income for, uh, for parks and, and recreation facilities. And the fee requirements um, for apartments uh, really don't, um, because of the restriction that they placed on, uh, that, to, to step back a second, in addition to Quimby, the city enacted a, what's called a FIN policy, a uh, FIN ordinance, and that was to capture apartments. However, the limitations on the creation of, uh, or securing fees from these apartments um, basically uh, makes it impossible right now to generate any of them because you had to have a zone change associated with that development. And the way zoning has been changed in LA, it makes it pretty much um, a moot point. So in terms of recent activity related to Quimby, um, the audits uh, back in 2006 and 2008 were, were mentioned of both RAP and uh, Quimby. And out of those audits came some changes. Uh, one was uh, administrative improvements to the Quimby program to make it work smoother. Uh, the, the needs assessment uh, that um, was mentioned of recreation and parks. A city task force was uh, developed to, de uh, to establish recommendations for improving Quimby. And that work just got started and some recommendations were made when the um, recession hit and the uh, departments um, were really uh, impacted by staff cuts. More recently, uh, Council Member Jose Huizar introduced two, a few motions, including 12-1178 and uh, a related measure that really directs the planning department to establish a work program to take forward those recommendations and actually start making some changes. The planning department uh, developed staff and funding requirements, and the city went out and secured funding from three foundations to actually do the work. And uh, Ramey and Associates, who many of you know from the health and wellness element, was brought on board to continue that work. AB 1359 was passed last year, and this was a statewide measure that was attempting to um, improve state Quimby Act to address um, park inequities. Um, and very briefly, what happened to that is that there were restrictions placed or requirements placed on use of the, uh, you know, ex using the funds for park poor communities that essentially made the law ineffective. And we really don't see it as moving forward. Um, there's a 
more detailed discussion in the policy brief if you want to have the details on that. But suffice to say that we don't see AB 1359 as necessarily uh, moving forward anytime soon in many cities. So our recommendations. The first recommendation is to expand the service radius. We want to, right now, the, um, the public recreation plan specifies up to two miles maximum radius for using that money. You have a development, you can only use that money within up to two miles. What we're recommending is to expand that from two to between five and ten miles. This would reduce the difficulty in finding and acquiring affordable and suitable sites and would expand the area in which parks can be located. The second recommendation is to clarify and expand eligibility. Right now, the uh, public recreation plan specifies a number of different um, types of uh, park and recreation facilities. We want to expand that to be explicit to, uh, to include a, a much broader range of facilities, including community gardens, things like skate parks, that will uh, sort of uh, give the flexibility to uh, meet the needs of, of different communities. That would also provide, um, uh, help tailor parks to the, the community needs and characteristics as they're doing outreach to communities uh, and, and engaging them more effectively. And it expands areas where parks could be located and the actual nature of those parks. The third recommendation is to update the credits. The credits right now for on-site recreational amenities developed by the housing developer really are, are, are not up to date. Um, and they don't correspond to the actual cost of building these amenities. Um, we hope to see incentives to uh, create publicly accessible facilities. So it's not sort of a, a garden uh, patio on top of a multi-unit building, but something that is on the ground and, and publicly available to, to the full community. And we think it's important to expand the range of facilities for which credit is given. The fourth recommendation uh, addresses the fee deferrals I mentioned for uh, affordable housing. Um, Right now, any project, like I said, with affordable units gets a deferral for the entire project. And what we think is that only the affordable units should be uh, deferred. And affordable housing developers overall should get um, exempted. So we also believe that there should be consideration given to the minimum length of affordability. Right now, the law says these units that get the deferral are only, uh, only have to be affordable for 10 years after which they could go to market rate. We think that should be extended out to 55 years, um, something a little bit more reasonable. The fifth recommendation is to support land dedication, especially for publicly accessible and or offsite uh, dedication in park poor communities. In order to help have this happen, it's really important that developers uh, consult early with um, both Recreation and Parks Department and the Planning Department. And that's not required right now. If people think about deferral, oftentimes the development, the design has already been made and it would be very costly for the developer to go back and, and try and um, uh, think about these kinds of um, uh, publicly accessible uh, land dedications. Supporting land dedication would reduce the accumulation of unspent Quimby funds and it could actually speed up uh, provision of sites for parks. The sixth recommendation is to adjust fee schedules for in-loop payment. This recognizes that current schedules are well below market rate um, and uh, it's important to employ a different schedule of annual adjustments and add credit factors for public access, locating these facilities in park poor areas and in create incentives for developers to provide private, private coverage of maintenance and operation costs if that's feasible. Um, and it would increase funds for going to city parks. The next steps, WESAR's motions um, are you know, in progress. The planning department, as I mentioned, has hired Ramey and Associates to, to carry out the work plan. A Quimby Advisory Committee has been uh, established. I um, think they're planning on meeting three times. They've already met once, and I understand that's going well. Alina's member of it. I'm sure there's some, a few other members in the room. I think Lark was on it. Um, Manal is on it. And then there's uh, the Land Trust Campaign. 
uh, to, to move forward these recommendations. We're right now in the process of talking to a lot of different groups uh, to educate them about Quimby and secure their support uh, for the recommendations that we have to, to make changes to, to uh, Quimby policy. Um, if anybody is interested in having us come and talk to you about the Quimby campaign, we'd love to do it. We'd love to get you on board. Our goal is to uh, secure endorsements from at least 100 organizations as we move forward in support. As I said, you know, everybody in City Hall is, understands and is supportive of the idea of making these changes. When we talk to people out in the community, they think these changes need to be made once they're uh, aware of what needs to happen. So uh, we really want to uh, make this a, a, a broad-based, well-supported campaign as we move forward. Um, so we're in that education and outreach process and would love to talk to you uh, as we move forward with the, with the coalition. And I'll end with that, maybe a little bit early, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody will be happy about that. Thank you. Any questions for our last group of speakers here? Right there in the back, right in front of the camera, yes. Um, so we heard a lot about like health equity and how parks can uh, benefit uh, people in very, in very many ways. But do you, do you consider things like air pollution and hazardous waste when considering where parks are located? Because, I mean, it's great that people are coming out and interacting with community members and kids having a place to play, but what about those places where there are like high rates of asthma or air pollution is just really bad, so it's maybe not as nice to play outdoors? You know, location is, is really important when you're thinking about the health impacts. And um, it's a serious dilemma um, I think Mike's uh, comment about, you know, communities saying, no, we don't want to park in our neighborhood, primarily probably because of safety issues and worry that it's going to attract a bad element, you know. The same can be said, the uh, same is true for air heavily polluted areas. And I think, um, I don't have the answer, but I do know that um, all of these issues have to come up in a, in a, in a appropriate um, engagement, civic engagement process related to parks. Um, I don't know if there is, uh, you know, I work on environmental justice uh, issues related to air pollution as well, clean up, green up campaign. And, you know, it's, it's, that is trying to address pollution and revitalize communities at the same time. And it's very, very difficult. So I really don't have an answer, but I do think that if a community is, is, um, is, uh, addressed and engaged in the process, then that information hopefully would come out as part of the uh, interactive nature of it, as well as sort of the, the, the health impact of the park just based upon the environmental surrounding it. The answer to the question is yes, but the um, just, I mean, this university alone put out a study saying that you shouldn't build within, you know, so many feet of a freeway. I mean, there's, there's it's a double-edged sword, you know, so it's, um, we struggle with that, um, but it, it ultimately comes down to individual communities. You really got to rely on, you know, what they're willing to support. Um, but um, quite often there is land available in those types of areas. Um, but it, it takes that engagement process to really make it work. I think your question, again, highlights the importance of sustainability planning because it's holistic, right? So it's not targeting one thing like park equity or targeting one thing like health. It's really... Uh, an opportunity to holistically think about how do we improve human well-being, opportunity, livelihoods, all at the same time in a systematic way. It's an incredibly and increasingly complex issue as we get resources in for things like transit-oriented development, so that issue of where we build. But one of the things that is often the case is that people are already living there, so it's not like the park necessarily changes their exposure. So I just appreciate the nuance and the humility that all the speakers are bringing. Other questions? I see a lot of hands in the front here. This question is directed to Mr. Scholl. Um, I know you mentioned that it's been hard buying a property just because it's so expensive for parks. And I was wondering if you guys have looked up, looked into um, converting alleyways in Los Angeles and if, um, what efforts are, are being made for that? Well, uh, First, what I said was it was a there was a time where it was extremely difficult to buy property. Property values, well, although they're on the rise now, but um, many of the properties we got were at a very discounted uh, price from when the economy was growing so much. Um, 
there is actually a very strong movement on alleyways going on with uh, with conversion of alleyways to green space, um, and you know we're 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 kind of involved at a, at 10,000 feet. Um, it's in the parks world, and it, when it comes to, to Los Angeles by charter, it has to, you know mainly has to be dedicated parkland that we look at. So some of the challenges, and we'll figure it out. But some of the challenges are in the city is they're in public in the public right of way. So sharing of money and resources on those types of things are, are the city charter gets in the way a little bit but um, we're supportive of it absolutely i mean it, whether it's us taking it doesn't have to be us that takes care of it you know so and and certainly um, in fact i've just volunteered to help build uh not a green alleyway but a something similar um in, a, in the public right away so we're, we're we're going to to participate but it's um uh that's I think that, that is relatively uh, fresh and new as to the as to the green movement. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Liam, part of a trade tech. Uh, we're actually starting our first garden there. Uh, we're probably going to have it finished around next year. It's our first little well, edible garden because we have a kind of calendar. But I have a two-part question for the panel. Uh, the first part is um, I read here a little bit about sidewalk gardening, and I wondered to know more if the trust is involved in that, uh, the challenges and uh, those prospects of it, and also uh, my main question is also related to uh, community gardening when we're producing food that people can actually eat. And my question is, uh, I live in South Central LA, so would it be possible for the people who grow the fruit to actually sell the fruit to actually be sustainable and dependable on the fruit? Because when we see the case of the South Central farmers, the uh, farmers were kicked out because the owner of the land decided that people there were using the fruit to sell and make a living, and that was. I guess it didn't sit too well with him. So my question is, can people create community gardens and can people make a living out of uh, making community gardens? On city property or on public property, you you can't run a bu you can't run a business with, uh, at the expense of the you know of the property. So you, how we do that is through uh, you know where we do run businesses. There's concession agreements and things like that. They get much more complicated. Um, you know, to run a business out of, and I'll just say for a park, we do that through agreements. That makes it very challenging for, you know, I think what you're talking about is where they're, um, you know, selling selling food maybe at a at a farmer's market or something like that off out of a, maybe something that they grew in a park. That, you know, where we have our challenges with that is, is there's there's all sorts of, you know, the, the, the county uh, rules on food distribution and all those sorts of things that, that we would have to require of them to do that. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that it's not. We don't normally do that. And I was just saying the town and health department is actively looking at different issues around street vending, as well as some of the uh, foods grown in school gardens and community gardens. And recently, the chronic disease directors have been meeting with the environmental health directors because many of the things the chronic disease directors want in terms of increasing access to healthy food make the environmental director health directors want to pass out and faint because they think it'll you know kill people so they're trying to figure out how they can right. you know come to some common agreements about things like a tomato grown in a school garden can that be fed to a child even though there's not full kitchen facilities well <laughs> you should become an environmental health director. Um, so I want to take one or two more questions. Our final speaker has arrived. I'm going to give preferential focus to anyone who hasn't asked a question at all, but all of our speakers, I think, will be staying till the end and afterwards for further questions. Right here, sir. Yeah, my question is um, related towards the recommendations that you spoke of earlier, more specifically exemptions for nonprofit developers and uh, related to the Quimby Act or the Quimby um, policy. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Um, I'll, I'm going to refer this to Don Spivak, the lead. They want to know more about the uh, deferrals, the fee deferrals on affordable housing. Affordable housing, yeah. The, um, currently, any project that includes some portion of the units being affordable is entitled to defer the could be payments on the entire project. Mm -hmm. So a uh, project has 10% of the units affordable and the rest of them are market rate, the entire project gets a deferral. In addition, the regulations allow uh, an affordable unit to qualify if the, if the period of affordability is as short as 10 years. 
Most other programs uh, in Los Angeles for affordable housing require that a unit be affordable for, at this point, a minimum of 55 years. So one thing is to say, well, if we really are talking about the deferral to promote affordable housing, which is a whole other goal, then the affordability should be there for a substantial period of time. So the recommendation is that the deferral be extended to the minimum 55 years that other affordable housing is required to, to match. The second is that the point of the deferral is to promote affordable housing and to say that for the most part affordable housing gets some form of subsidy. So if you don't defer the, the park fee for affordable housing, you're in effect subsidizing it from another public source. So if that's meritorious, fine, exempt the affordable units, but there's no particular reason why the market rate unit should be exempted. Is there any communication or formal relationship between the housing department and Rec and Parks so that you know almost when you've hit a critical point of housing going into a community and there's no recreation? It, it's mainly with city planning, you know, not so much. I mean, it's, it's, it's through that process that we learn about all these developments. Um, that's how we're notified is through city planning um, when they're going through their permit processes. Um, so the earlier you're, you're I think you're, the earlier we know about it, the more likely we are to work and be able to work with the developer on solving some of these things that we're talking about with Quimby or building a park. Um, and that, does, that has not always been the case. I will tell you that it's improved, um, but it could be better. A big round of applause for our panel. Thank you so much.